Welcome to the Story Geek Show. On today's show, I will be digging deeper into Spider-Man No Way Home. What makes Spider-Man No Way Home so good? Or is Spider-Man No Way Home actually overrated? We'll dig deeper into that and talk about the deeper questions raised by this film. This show will contain spoilers for Spider-Man No Way Home. I'm Jay Shear, co-writer of Death of a Bounty Hunter and Time Slingers, and this is the Story Geek Show. Spider-Man No Way Home came out last year, and despite the pandemic, it did something extraordinary. It made $260 million here in the U.S. in its opening weekend. And to prove how ridiculous that was for a 2021 film, the second highest grossing film of 2021 was Venom, Let There Be Carnage, another Spider-Verse film, ironically, but that only made $90 million in its opening weekend. So No Way Home made almost three times the amount of Venom. And Spider-Man No Way Home went on to become the highest grossing movie of last year, of 2021. In a rough year for movies, Spider-Man No Way Home performed well beyond any expectations. But it didn't only do well in terms of revenue. It also had one of the highest user scores on Metacritic for an MCU film. Right now it's at 8.6. In other words, people actually loved this film. I even said it was my second favorite MCU film behind Guardians of the Galaxy. After seeing it twice, it's definitely still in my top five, but why? And why would people say that it might be overrated? Based on how popular Spider-Man No Way Home was, the biggest question on the table is when we look back on it, will we think that Spider-Man No Way Home is overrated? If you have thoughts on this, go ahead and throw those down in the comments. As a writer and storyteller, I have some complex thoughts on whether or not Spider-Man No Way Home is overrated. So let's get into that by looking at some of the data first. So Spider-Man No Way Home had the second biggest box office opening of any MCU film ever. The only film that outperformed No Way Home was Avengers Endgame, which was huge, one of the biggest films of all time. So it has one of the highest, if not the highest, Metacritic scores for all of the MCU movies. And if you've seen my other video on my other YouTube channel about that, it was on the podcast feed as well, where I talked about how the critics and the users rated each one of the MCU films and how that comes about in a, in a tier list, then you would know how well Spider-Man No Way Home does in the tier lists. It's super high up there. So based on that data, it'd be easy to say that it was not overrated. But I think we should also keep in mind that people really wanted to get out of their houses since the worst of the pandemic had kind of appeared to be over at the end of the year, people really wanted to get out of their houses and go do something different, which may have made Spider-Man No Way Home a little bit more popular. The movie had massive spoilers associated with it. You had to go see it in the theater because if you waited, you would most likely be spoiled. I know some things were spoiled for me because I'm involved in this world and always thinking about these things. So you had to get to the theaters to see this film. Otherwise, you'd be very spoiled spoiler heavy stuff going on on social media and then on top of all of that all the other mcu films released during the pandemic were disappointing eternals is the lowest rated mcu film again something you'd know if you listen to my mcu tier list podcast or watch any of those videos black widow didn't do well and even shang chi was considered just kind of okay so does that mean that we may have been emotionally in a place where Spider-Man No Way Home made a lot more sense for us to love? Well, here's, here's kind of my take. I'm going to look deeper into how this story unfolds to assess whether or not it's actually underrated. And we'll start with the negatives, right? Let's get the negatives out of the way so we can get into the positives. I do think that the first thing that we need to come to terms with is that Spider-Man No Way Home does not have the best structure. The setup is a bit convoluted. It relies on Doctor Strange agreeing to cast a very suspect spell. <laughs> Seems like something he maybe should not do. We'll get into that later. And the entire beginning of the film is fine, but it's not great. It's a little clunky in places. And like I said, we'll talk about that some more later. Two, the other thing that we should consider in terms of saying whether or not it's overrated is that if we ask the question, what is Spider-Man No Way Home all about, which we're also going to dig deeper into later in this show, 
it's asking a philosophical question that isn't necessarily answered in a way that is super understandable. You could also call the premise of this film a little clunky. It's sort of something, if I was to say what the premise of the film was, it'd be something like curing people as opposed to killing them or, in, or imprisoning them. So these are villains, right? Killing villain or curing villains as opposed to killing them or imprisoning them leaves us more joyful and satisfied rather than regretful and shameful, right? That's kind of the premise of the film. It's not a terrible premise, but the execution on that premise can get a little rough at times. And the core premise itself, I have some questions about. So we'll get into that later. But if you were a person who did not like Spider-Man No Way Home, those are some of the things that you may be kind of gravitating towards to say, hey, look, it feels like it's a little bit overrated to me, especially when you compare it to some of these amazing MCU films that we've gotten in the past. Now, on the good side of it, to say, hey, the film's not overrated at all, there are some things that we really need to look at. First, the second half of this film, Spider-Man No Way Home, is amazing. That pun is intended. <laughs> Once Aunt May dies, which functions as the midpoint of the film, Spider-Man No Way Home is near perfect, at least in my opinion. The second half of this film is phenomenal. The first half, a bit clunky at uh, parts. Second half of the film, phenomenal. Two, the use of Garfield, Andrew Garfield, and Tobey Maguire is exceptional. Just like Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which No Way Home owes a lot to, in my opinion, because it follows some of the same concepts that that film does. Just like that film, we can see the mistakes of the other Spideys that the other Spideys have made, and that helps Tom Holland's Spider-Man overcome his personal challenges in order to come out a hero, right? So that's pretty cool, and it's cool to see all the interaction between those guys. And then three, the other thing that I think we need to make note of is that the ending of the film has real consequences for Peter. And the last scene is incredibly satisfying from that perspective. It's somewhat tragic. It's really hard to pull off in a Spider-Man film with Tom Holland, but they, they do it. They pull it off really, really good. And then four, the performances across the board in this film are absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. In fact, Ned's one of my favorite MCU characters. MJ is great. Uh, J. Jonah Jameson, amazing. Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, Killing it. They're all great in this film. So here's my conclusion as to whether or not Spider-Man No Way Home is overrated. If you think the setup of the film, the beginning of Act 1, start of the beginning of Act 2 as well, if you think those are clunky, I think you're right. I think you're onto something. If you think Doctor Strange agreeing to cast a memory erasing spell is completely insane and totally out of character for him, I totally agree with you. You've got something there. And if you dislike the premise, um, or you think it's a little clunky, like I do, and I'll explain that some more later, then I think you've got some ammo for saying that this film maybe is a little bit overrated. But if you dislike the second half of the film, which I think is truly exceptional, then we definitely do not agree. So the reason this film is in my top five films in the MCU is that it that lets the audience experience every emotion, and it is a great time, and it makes for great cinema film. This is the kind of film you want to see in the theater, and you want to see it for the first time in the theater, too, if you could. And the way the storytellers incorporate all the different Spider-Men, whether it's Andrew Garfield or Tommy McGuire, is amazing. Amazing. Some of the, some of the moments that we get in this film where... Tobey Maguire's character gets to make amends for something that happened in his, in his films, or Andrew Garfield gets to make amends for something that happens in his films, is just done perfectly well. It is the best type of fan service that you can possibly have in a movie. I don't know that we've ever seen it done better, let's put it that way. And at the end of the day, this film is extremely satisfying. I don't think I've seen a second half of a film that's this good since we saw Rogue One which was phenomenal as well. So my final take is no Spider-Man No Way Home is not overrated. It is truly exceptional. But I do think that, you know, with any film, nothing's perfect. And so there are some things that you could say, well, it was, to me it was overrated because of some of the things that I talked about. But maybe you have some other reasons. If you do, leave those down in the comments below. But for me, Spider-Man No Way Home, 
is a phenomenal film. I did not think that it's overrated. I think it's one of the best films in the MCU. I said it was number two. Is it going to stay number two? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I have to watch some of the other films again and just make sure that I'm not reacting to the latest and greatest. But let's talk about the best and the worst scenes in Spider-Man No Way Home. Because the beginning is a little clunky. The ending is phenomenal. What are some of the best scenes that guide our experience of this film? I'm going to start with the negatives again. Um, and again, don't let me bring your high down with any film that I talk about that I, that I say anything negative about. Because you should love what you love regardless of what I think. But I do think that the, the worst scene in Spider-Man No Way Home is to me the Doctor Strange scene where he's casting the spell so that people forget who Peter Parker is or forget that he's Spider-Man, I should say. And the basic premise for why I think this is the worst scene is because I don't see a world in which Doctor Strange agrees to do this spell. It does not seem like something he would do. Um, not only that, this spell is far too convenient given the potential consequences. So in other words, I don't see, like I said, I don't see a way that Dr. Strange would agree to do this for Peter Parker. That does not make sense to me. Now, the film does need a gimmick to be able to accomplish what it needs to accomplish by bringing in the other Spideys and bringing in the villains so that we get the amazing ending that we have. It's not going to be an easy thing to pull off. So as I say this is the worst film in the movie, I do think that under scrutiny, it sort of falls apart a little bit. But as I say that, the scene works in the context of the film. It, it kind of works. It, it doesn't go off the rails. We don't go, oh my gosh, this is just a terrible movie when you see this scene. So in other words, it may be the worst scene in the movie, but it by far is not a terrible scene. So how do the writers make this scene work? Because it's very clunky. You got to get Doctor Strange in a matter of minutes to do something that he would probably never do. <laughs> and, they, and here's how they do it. Here's how they do it. Here's how they make it work. It's almost like the way that Back to the Future makes time travel work. That is to say, they make it very comedic and they make it cartoony, and they make it seem like it's all like something that may happen, and it's kind of just kind of chaotic, but it's a fun chaos, and that's the way that this scene works. Because if you took us back to a tone of the Doctor Strange tone from the Doctor Strange movie, from the first Doctor Strange movie, there's no way it feels like Doctor Strange is doing this for a kid hero that he's met, right? It does not, he's going to go, you know what? I'm sorry, you just can't mess with this. And they'd have to figure out some other way. You know, maybe they have Ned since Ned, you know, could use some of the magic. Maybe have, have Ned come in and try to do some of the, the spell. And maybe Ned is the one that messes it up. That seems more believable to me than Doctor Strange changing his mind in the course of a five minute scene and saying, like, yeah, sure, I'll help you out. But. The writers pull it off because they keep, they keep there, there's tension in the scene, there's conflict in the scene, and they keep that humorous to the point where we know, for example, that Doctor Strange makes a joke with uh, Wong about using the scene to forget a party that they had, right? And so you know that they're, they're using comedy and they're using this cartooniness to be able to get through this scene in a way that we're not just going to go, I don't believe this scene, and then our suspension of disbelief is gone and we're out, right? No, they don't do that. Um, if they tried to make this super serious and tried to convert Doctor Strange into a believer in Peter's objectives in a matter of five minutes, I don't think we ever would have gotten there. So uh, that is my worst scene just because it doesn't really seem to align with what um, the character of Doctor Strange would do in that circumstance or that situation. But that's enough negativity. Let's get into the best scene, the best scene in this film. Now, this is why I think this film is so good. There are a ton of options for the best scene. And you and I might not actually pick the same one. So here are some of the scenes that I thought were amazing that I did not pick. And I'll let you know which one I did pick in a second. The arrival of Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire, and even as that bleeds into them meeting Peter and then going on to try and create cures for the villains, 
those are all fantastic scenes. The way that they incorporate Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire into this film is exceptional. We talked about that earlier. The way that they're able to say, you knew these characters from other films, they're going to look and feel and act like they did in those films, maybe just a little older versions of, of those characters. And the way that they're able to relate those into the MCU, taking Sony characters that had nothing, the MCU wasn't even around at that point in time, now, granted, Kevin Feige did have a role in the Spider-Man, uh, the original Spider-Man trilogy with Tobey Maguire. I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was oh, he had some oversight of that, the Sam Raimi um, versions there. But the way that they're incorporated here shows a real understanding of who those characters were and how they might show up in this film. So that's fantastic. But I didn't pick that as my best. The Doc Ock fight on the freeway, despite the fact that it comes at a weird part of the movie in terms of the structure of the film, that fight is visually awesome. And the way that they're doing the CG, the way that um, Tom Holland is is kind of trying to deal with saving the, uh, the educational um, administrator, the, the MIT, the lady from MIT, the way he's trying to save her and the way that Doc Ock is attacking, phenomenal. All that stuff is great, visually amazing. Aunt May's death, which marks the midpoint of the film, is done extraordinarily well. If you thought that Tom Holland, which we already know because we've all, we've all seen Endgame, we've all seen Tom in these other roles. If you thought Tom Holland couldn't handle emotional scenes, then you're totally wrong because this kid is amazing in emotional scenes. Does a great job um, dealing with the death of Aunt May. Uh, she does a great job of delivering the without, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, which is a big Spider-Man theme and usually comes from Uncle Ben. The fact that she delivers it here and does that well is phenomenal. And another moment from a scene, because the whole final battle has a bunch of great moments, but maybe my favorite moment in that entire scene, because you could pick that scene, which is an extended scene, you could pick that scene as just full of amazing moments. You've got the Garfield Maguire interaction where um, Tobey Maguire is telling Andrew Garfield Spider Man that he's amazing, right? That's that's great. Um, but my favorite moment in that big scene, in that long scene, my favorite moment is actually when Andrew Garfield Spider Man saves MJ. Because we know going back that that was something that he was not able to do in his films. And so that moment, even though we don't stay in that moment for a very long period of time, you know, for some for a fan of Spider-Man and somebody who's seen all these films, that moment is phenomenal. And the fact that they were able to pull it off so quickly, have it mean so much, is again, storytellers who understand the stories that have come before understand the trauma that was induced on the characters in those stories and then able to play that out is just um it's really good storytelling especially from a franchise model drawing stories in that were not a part of this franchise and now they're making them a part of this franchise and doing it so well is pretty remarkable so I think that that is is really really cool now I've gone on and on about all these really cool scenes and all these really cool moments what is the best scene in this film? And this is where it's going to get controversial because you may not agree with this, but I love this scene. My favorite scene, what I think is the best scene in Spider-Man No Way Home is when Peter Parker walks into the diner at the end of the film. Now, why would I say that? Why is the ending of this film so powerful? Well, the first thing is that it proves that Peter's actions have real consequences in the real world. A lot of times with superhero films, you know, it's going to get retconned, it's going to get figured out, and this probably will do at some point, right? But the fact that Peter comes into this space and has to deal with his poor decision making from earlier in the film, and that's caught up with him here, is amazing. So, Doctor Strange. In the worst scene, by the way, which still means it's a pretty decent scene because I'm bringing that up as being meaningful to the film. But Doctor Strange, when he's casting the spell for Peter, he says, the problem is not Mysterio. It's you trying to live two different lives. So the consequences of living two separate lives plays itself out to the point where Peter can't be with his best friend or with the girl that he loves, the woman that he loves. 
At the beginning of the film, the worst scene has to be played for comedy because Peter isn't thinking through his actions, right? And Doctor Strange probably wouldn't do this for him. So it has to be played as kind of comedy, just like Back to the Future plays with its time travel, not as a scientific idea, but as this like whole thing that like, hey, it's just a gimmick, people. It's just a gimmick. Just go along with it because it's going to create greater things to come, right? Both of these films do that, and then we go, okay, we'll go with it. We'll kind of go with it. Um, I do think Back to the Future does a slightly better job with its gimmick than does Spider-Man No Way Home, but that's an aside. But the point is, is that Peter's desire to have everything the way that he wants it to be, talked a lot about this in uh, last week's um, show about uh, wanting to create wanting to be our own gods, right? Where we could say, I want everything to work out for me and everything to be good for me. Well, basically this is Peter saying, I'm going to mess with reality because my life's kind of difficult and it would be easier if I didn't have to deal with this. And now he has to, in this diner scene at the very end of the film, where he goes to see MJ and see Ned, people who no longer remember him, now he has to figure out, okay, how do I get back into their good graces. I want to be in love again. I want to be with my best friend again. And he can't do it. He can't do it. So that's why I think that that scene is so powerful. The consequences for Peter's earlier actions, doing something that he should not have done, the character development of him saying, I'm going to have to deal with this to the point where he makes a choice for the world to forget that he's Spider-Man the consequences are pretty severe and Peter has to feel those. And that's when this film at the very, very end becomes very bittersweet. And I think that in a Spider-Man film with Tom Holland, where this is mostly fun times, that is a pretty compelling way to end this film and a very interesting way of ending this film. So that's why the diner scene to me is the best scene. The end, the end scene is the best scene in my opinion as it relates to Spider-Man No Way Home. But let's go a little bit deeper into the premise of Spider-Man. What is the premise of Spider-Man No Way Home? So that we can answer the overarching question, what is Spider-Man No Way Home about? What is this film about? So the idea, and why would we take a premise of the film? Because the premise of a film is what captures a truth about the shared human experience, right? So a premise tries to capture, tries to say, we should care about this film because our brains will learn about how the world works from this film. That's basically why we would even have a premise in a film to begin with. So a premise is a really good way for us to understand what the film's all about. Because if we, if we dissect the premise, why are we even telling this story? What about the shared human experience does this capture as truth? Then we can say the film is really about this, right? So a solid premise is what makes audiences resonate with a film at a deeper level. There are really two core elements to stories that make people really connect with them. You know, we connect with stories for all kinds of reasons, but two of the most impactful ways that we connect with stories are the characters and the premise. The characters because we can see ourselves in the film and the premise because we can see that it reveals a truth about the world that we may have been ignoring or maybe needing to think deeper about. And in this film, by the way, the characters shine. The characters are amazing in this film, which we'll talk about a little bit later when we, scare, when we compare it to the Batman. But when we get to the premise, you'll notice that part of it resonates, but then part of it is a little bit muddy. Part of it resonates and then part of it is like a little bit muddy. So the film's pre premise is essentially that curing people results in personal fulfillment and then restored relationships. So curing people results in personal fulfillment, basically being a hero, being selfless and having good character. And it also results in restored relationships, right? Now we now some of the spider Spider-Men can become friends with some of the villains when they cure them and we have restored relationships that happen. So the second half of that premise probably resonates with just about everyone, right? 
only like really, really hurt people are like, I don't want to have restored relationships and I definitely don't want personal fulfillment and I don't care about my character. Most people care about their character. They want personal fulfillment and they want restored relationships, right? So most people will resonate with the truth of us wanting that out of life. But let's break this down a little bit further. If Peter kills Green Goblin out of the revenge, out of revenge for May's death, so his aunt... Green Goblin kills Aunt May. We we all saw that happen in this film. If he kills Green Goblin out of revenge, then he'll feel guilt, he'll feel shame, he'll sink into despair. Most likely. Most likely. In fact, some of the other Spider-Men are kind of educating him on that, right? So if he does that, he'll become the villain that J. Jonah Jameson actually thinks he is if he were to kill Green Goblin. But if he saves Green Goblin, he'll realize that his character meant more to him than he might ever imagine. And he'll get personal fulfillment out of it. And he'll realize that he did the right thing. And like I said, that's why Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire are all there. To point t Peter, to point him in the direction of being a hero, and to point him away from being a villain. They literally do that, <laughs> right? Um, Tobey Maguire um, literally catches uh, the... Green Goblin's, what do you call it? His, his hoverboard, for lack of a better word. Since we're on a back to the, the back to the future comparison here, so they want to point him towards personal fulfillment and hope, and away from despair. So the second half of the premise, like I said, mostly works. It's the first half of the premise where things get a little bit more cloudy for us, like I mentioned just a second ago, and it kind of causes us to ask more questions about whether or not we might actually agree with the film's premise. And the first question I think we need to ask is essentially, can we cure other people? Can we cure other people? Because the premise of this film is we need to cure as many other people as possible. And a quick follow-up to that question is, how would we go about curing people? But we also need to ask a deeper question, and that is, why do people need to be cured? You know, what is the root of human beings choosing to do evil? What's the root cause of that? And is that something you could even cure? And is evil the result of something that can be cured? Another way of asking that. And if you were to cure them, does that, does that actually make them incapable of doing evil? Again, right? So many questions relative to curing people, especially villains, that are evil. So I think this aspect of the film's premise is demanding more information from us. It demands more thought from us. It demands us to engage a little bit more. It is not a clear-cut premise. There are some really clear-cut premises, right? We should uh, do this so that we will get this result. Um, there, are also, there are also negative premises, right? Um, uh, ruthlessness will always result in you know, despair or ruined relationships or whatever it is, right? There's these negative premises. This one is, hey, cure people and it will be good for you and it will be also good for them in the ways that we already talked about earlier. But this also asks a question about like, well, why are the villains that we find in films, why are those villains evil? And can we just cure them of it, <laughs> right? Like could, um, could Thanos have been cured of his problems? Could... Um, could Ronan be cured of his evil? Could Zemo be cured of the things that he was doing? So I think that there's part of this premise, this first part of the premise, that definitely will resonate with a lot of people. There's this concept of like hurt people hurt people. And this film is kind of saying like, well, is there a way to cure those hurt people so that they won't hurt other people? Um. And for people who have severe trauma, whether it's mental or physical trauma, yeah, that, there is a part of this that rings true. Like we need to help cure those people. But it's it's also not like people with trauma or with physical or mental ailments. It's not like they all become villains. 
So this cure, curing people aspect continues to be a little bit odd, right? Um, for example, in the film, Peter almost kills Green Goblin. And if he had, what cure would Peter have needed, right? Because now Peter is acting. Now, now you could say, well, Peter had the trauma of Aunt May. And could we have solved that? And if we had solved, if we had cured him from the trauma of Aunt May, would he have gone on to try and kill Green Goblin? Uh, we could ask that question. Maybe that's part of the premise here, right? Now, as I mentioned earlier, obviously Garfield and Maguire's Spider Man, Spider Men, <laughs> I don't know how to say that, Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire and their personifications of Spider Man are present here to help Peter deal with the trauma of losing Aunt May. That is part of his cure, is them trying to help him understand that from a different perspective because they also had trauma in their lives, which then help them communicate to Peter, Tom Holland's Peter, about you know what this cure could, could actually look like. So all of those things are true, but I think here are some other questions we have to consider. Why do people, even people who want to do good, maybe people like you and me, right? People like Peter. Even though we want to do good, why do we do bad things? It's not just villains who do bad things. Everybody does bad things. In fact, I usually am pretty frustrated when there's a character and the character is like perfect and never does anything bad because I'm like, well, when have you ever met a character like this before, right? Unless unless there's a character that specifically we're told, like, like Superman, right? This is a character who specifically is a Boy Scout. He does good things. That, okay, I prefer more complex characters who do bad things too, but it is what it is. The second question I have is, is there such a thing as a cure for doing bad things? Could we all do something that would prevent us from ever doing another bad thing again. And then the third question I have is, even if we cure the evil actions of individuals, what about the evil that exists outside of people's actions, right? Natural disasters cause a lot of havoc. They ruin environments, they kill people, they're bad. Cancer, cancer kills people, it kills animals, it's bad. Diseases, we just came through, well, we're maybe partially in a pandemic. Seems pretty bad. Seems pretty bad. And of course, death. We're all going to have to face death. So what about the evil that exists outside the actions of individuals? And these are all super deep questions, by the way. I like talking about these kinds of things, obviously, on this podcast, if you listen to it. Now, one of the things I talk about frequently on this podcast is that you're going to come to conclusions about these things partially based on your upbringing, partially based on your own experiences, partially based on some of your value systems and what you've chose to believe in. So for me, as a Christ follower, I believe in sin. People do bad things because people are inherently selfish. They're inherently sinful. Nobody can be perfect. Show me a perfect person and I'll be shocked. So it's impossible for people to be perfect and therefore they do bad things, right? And sin exists not just as the selfish, selfish acts of individuals. Sin exists not just as the selfish, selfish, I don't know why I'm having such a shellfish, selfish acts of individuals, but the entire universe is actually subject to imperfection. That's why we have natural disasters, that's why we have cancer, that's why we have disease, that's why we have death. There's no, there are no simple cures to these things. There's no way for Spider-Man or any of the rest of us to wipe out what we would call sin or evil of any kind, right? It, those things are still going to exist, which then makes the premise more difficult because is it a shared human experience that we can cure people? Or is that just the perspective of the storytellers that may not resonate with everybody? So I agree fully with the second half of the premise because I do think that we have a responsibility and with great power comes great responsibility to try and help other people and set them on a better path. That makes a lot of sense to me. And while I think that the premise is you know, a bit awkward in the middle of the film, I do think the consequences of Peter's actions and him not being able to reconnect with his best friend and his girlfriend do point towards a deeper complexity. 
So the premise about curing people to me is a bit muddy because it's not universal. It doesn't feel universal to me. But I do think that in the end, it it does showcase more of what the shared human experience actually looks like. You know, when Peter can't just cure everybody and it all works out great, there's some muddiness there. It's difficult. So I think that that's where the premise plays itself out a little bit better. The actual premise of saying, like, we should just cure people and then everybody will be happy and great. If the, if the film actually displayed that happening, I'd be like, man, I don't really like this premise because I don't know if this premise is really if it really means something, but because they can't cure everybody and because Peter does have to deal with the consequences of his own behavior, I think it actually works a lot better. So the actual premise is not my favorite, but the execution of the premise makes up for what the premise was actually intending to sort of say, (laughs) at least in my opinion, if you see a different premise or if there's some feelings that you have about how the premise played itself out, let me a comment and let me know. Cause I'd really like to hear your thoughts on how that the premise is so important because it is the truth of the shared human experience. And when I see a premise that's strange, it's really hard for me to get over that. Now this one, I go, that premise is a little bit strange. They're just going to cure all the villains. Why didn't they cure Thanos? Why didn't we cure villains all along in the MCU before we got here? It's, It's kind of strange, but then how it plays out. It's like, okay, I see what they mean. I think by curing them, I think what they mean is we should attempt to do good. And if we can't, then maybe we have to defeat evil, but we should attempt to change the evil thing into a better thing. That's what I think. That's what I think that they mean. But for my my, my uh, final topic today, we're going to get into a really interesting conversation here. Comparing Spider-Man No Way Home to the Batman. Spider-Man No Way Home versus the Batman. It's interesting to compare the two latest superhero films. We like to compare things as humans. Why not compare these two? So let's compare Spider-Man No Way Home to the Batman. And as many of you know, I love Spider-Man No Way Home. While I thought the Batman was, you know, it had this great potential. But ultimately, I thought it was decent instead of maybe amazing. So why is that? Let's break it down. Spider-Man No Way Home versus the Batman. I'm going to break this uh, comparison Spider-Man No Way Home versus the Batman. I'm going to break it up into categories. So let's start with the characters. Not just not just the lead character, but the entire cast of characters. I do think both films are fantastic in regards to their cast of characters. I'm going to give the W to No Way Home, but it's just slight. And here's why. I do believe that every character in No Way Home is exceptional for what it is that they are embodying. Ned is fantastic. MJ is fantastic. All three Peters in this film, you could argue that they're perfect and used extraordinarily well in the film. Now on the Batman side, Batman is very good. Catwoman is great. Penguin is fantastic. But all the other characters are probably good at best, but not quite as good as what we got with Spider-Man No Way Home. So I'm going to give the slight win for characters to Spider-Man No Way Home. Second, let's look at the plot. I think that the Batman actually has a better plot than Spider-Man No Way Home. Now, when I say the better plot, what I'm talking about is execution of events happening in what order they happen and how they happen. The Batman has a pretty good plot. It's very seven detective noir has all those elements to it. Spider-Man no way homes plot sets up some amazing moments, but it's maybe not as intriguing or as original as the Batman feels, at least in the world of superhero movies. So I'm going to give the edge on the plot to the Batman. Third, let's talk about the tone. Tone is going to be super subject, uh, subjective people, will love the tone of the Batman or will hate the tone of the Batman. It's entirely subjective. People have been saying for a long time, DC films suck because they're too dark and Marvel films are great because, you know, they're fun (laughs) or whatever they say, right? Like that's a very common complaint about DC versus Marvel. Um, I think a lot of people will probably 
like the lighter tone of No Way Home. It's probably a more ubiquitous tone for people to like. But a lot of people will love the gothic darkness of the Batman. So in my opinion, the tone is super subjective. Both handled the tone of their films extremely well. I don't think there's a winner here. I think it's basically a tie. Pick whichever one you like better. Uh, either way, the films stick with that tone. Like Spider-Man No Way Home feels like an MCU film. The Batman feels like you could have picked up a comic book and just read this movie as a comic, right? Especially the comics from the 80s and some of the comics from the 90s that were really dark. Fourth, uh, let's talk about structure. This is a very writing <laughs> or storytelling-centric breakdown of these two movies. Structure, these films are kind of exact opposites when it comes to structure. If you look at the Batman, the Batman has two and a half fantastic acts. acts act one of the Batman, fantastic. Act two of the Batman, fantastic. Act three is okay, but it suffers a little bit near the end there. Loses its way, you could say, a little bit near the end. Some, pe some people might disagree with me there, but I think the structure of the film, it uh, it tries to reach its climax, and then it kind of just does this kind of thing where it's like, oh, wait, no, we're almost to the end. You know, just hang in there. It's a little too long, maybe. Spider-Man No Way Home, on the other hand, is kind of the opposite of that. It sort of struggles early on. It struggles in Act 1. A little bit of the beginning of Act 2 isn't really that great. You're kind of thinking to yourself, like, where is this movie going? It's not it's not super interesting, but I guess it kind of feels like a Spider-Man movie, so I'm good with it, but it's not great. But then once it hits its midpoint with Aunt May's death, from that point on, it's awesome. It's great. So, you know, some some movies are like that. Some movies, the, the way that the structure of the film works, it's better at the beginning. Some of the structures are better at the end. I said earlier, you know, Spider-Man No Way Home is the best second half of a movie I think I've seen since Rogue One, which is a phenomenal third act. So, you know, in my, in my opinion, Spider-Man No Way Home is up there with some other fantastic movies. So I'm going to give Spider-Man No Way Home a slight edge because if a film starts out really well, but it doesn't end really well, the problem, the okay. So here, why 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 do we care more about the end of a film than we do about the beginning? And not, I'm not saying everyone needs to, but in the narrative arc, the film is working towards proving out its premise, proving out that there's a shared human experience that we're trying to live together toward, and that's why near the end of the film, because it's getting because we get more and more tense as an audience, that the reward, you can imagine it this way. I heard a singer talk about this once. It's really really good, really really good. The end of the film is essentially where m most of the dopamine will likely be released or most of the brain chemicals that cause us to experience pleasure or even if it's grief near the end. What we're experiencing in the film will likely be at its most intense at the climax of the film, end of act two, beginning of act three, in that kind of range. That's when we'll be most hyped and or most tense or most, you know, the most grief that we might be feeling is in that kind of part of the film but the beginning of the film is really important because it has to build up to that so that the brain continues to store those chemicals so that when it has a release of those chemicals it's the most possible grief or the most possible excitement or the most the funniest thing that could happen that's what you're aiming for if you're looking at a narrative arc right starts here it's lots and lots of conflict 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 raises up towards its climax and then it falls off after that we resolve the story so we tend to think, and I think it's because of the way our brains react to these stories, that the ending is a little bit more important than the beginning of the film is. So so for that reason, I'm going to give the win to Spider-Man No Way Home here. But the beginning of ba the Batman is amazing. The Batman is like a 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, all the way up until maybe you call it a third act. And if the film were a little bit shorter, it might have been able to deal with that a little bit better. But you know, it struggles there, I think. The fifth the fifth category we'll look at here is premise. Now, I think both films struggle here a little bit. No Way Home says we need to like cure people in order to be heroes. We talked about that earlier in the earlier segment. Like the premise is, it's an interesting premise to put out there, and then it, and I'm not even sure it proves its own premise super super well, but it does feel like we have a shared human experience by the end of the film. 
So I think it executes on its premise better than the premise actually is. <laughs> now, the Batman, I think, is actually the reverse of that in many ways. The Batman says we need to bring people hope as opposed to becoming the embodiment of, of vengeance. By the way, vengeance is like a super, super popular topic or premise for shows right now. So I don't know what that's about. Maybe it's because uh, coming out of the pandemic, we're too tribal, too against one another or something. I'm not sure. But here's what I think is kind of interesting to me is that Batman's core premise feels better to me. But I think that the execution of that premise suffers a little bit. It may be misapplied. The final monologue, the final voiceover where Batman talks about becoming hope, I think is very odd. And all of a sudden it like turns the movie into something that I didn't think it was building toward. And that's why it doesn't quite work for me. Spider-Man No Way Home is actually like the opposite. It's like the premise is like, well, I don't even know if I agree with that premise, but the way that it executes the premise actually seems like it makes sense. <laughs> so the premise makes less sense. The execution makes more sense. Whereas Batman, it's almost reversed. Is the premise makes more sense, but the execution makes less sense. So, and why do we care about premise? Because premise is the, about the shared human experience. It's the, does this match up with what I, how I think and feel and believe about the world? So premise is really important. So I'm going to give the slight nod here to Spider-Man No Way Home. I think it has a slightly better execution of its premise, even though I don't know that I agree with its premise as much. <laughs> but that's how that's how writing is, right? Like writing is so complex that breaking down these movies is is really can be difficult, you know. Uh, the sixth sixth uh, category here I want to talk about is epic moments. Movies really should have epic moments. Our stories should have epic moments to kind of draw us in. And each movie wins on a different type of epic moment. Again, this is very subjective. If you like one of these, pick which one you like better. But I would argue that Spider-Man No Way Home wins as it relates to emotional moments with the characters. There's quite a few of them. The fact that they bring in the other two Spider-Men into this world of the Tom Holland Spider-Man into the MCU is amazing. And some of the moments that they have together are fantastic. But the Batman definitely wins, in my opinion, as it relates to action sequences. The Batman has some beautifully filmed action sequences from the Batmobile chase where he's chasing the penguin to the hallway scene where he's walking through the hallway and they're firing machine guns at him. I mean, that those are beautiful, amazing sequences as it pertains to action. So you know what? To me, it's a tie. You pick one. You say which one you like better for whatever reason, and you, you're right. <laughs> it's just how it is. Um and then finally, the last thing is that I want to talk about is the embodiment of the character on the, on the screen. Now, one of the things I think is really interesting is that when I grew up with, with comic books, Batman and Spider-Man were two of my favorites. So comparing these two films is really interesting to me because I, I love both these characters. And most of you probably do. A lot of us like Spider-Man. A lot of us lo love Batman and Spider-Man. So the question I'm asking here is, which film seems to understand its characters better? And I think, for the most part, both films excel here, except, this is where I agreed with Ben Shapiro, by the way, if you want to go back and watch that video where I broke down Ben Shapiro's review and what I agreed with him and what I don't agree with him on, this is where I agree with Ben Shapiro. When you get to the monologue at the end of the Batman, it seems to completely fall apart in terms of its understanding of who Batman is. It's weird. It's weird. It's a weird monologue. I think if you change that monologue, I'd change a lot of my opinion about the film. But the monologue is very, very, very strange. And by the way, it's not that hard to change a monologue, right? Like just have, just have uh, Robert Pattinson come back and record a different monologue at the end. Just change a few words. You know, I think it would be much, much better if I had a different monologue at the end. But... I'm giving the win here to Spider-Man No Way Home because not only does Spider-Man No Way Home understand Tom Holland's version of Spider-Man, it understands Andrew Garfield's version of Spider-Man. It understands Tobey Maguire's version of Spider-Man. It understands why Ned is important to Tom Holland's character. It understands how MJ is a core part of the MCU and about her relationship with Spider-Man. It's phenomenal. It gets Spider-Man, it understands Spider-Man like no other. And by the way, I want to say this on record. I think Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, which I really enjoyed, by the way, is the best Spider-Man when it comes to 
him bickering with his enemies and teasing them as he fights them. His lines and the way he delivers his lines, he's the best Spider-Man when it comes to that part of the Spider-Man mythos. mythos. <laughs> Anyways, that's my opinion. So at the end of the day, despite the fact that I generally prefer DC movies over Marvel movies, I love both, but I tend to prefer some of the way that some of the questions DC is dealing with there. I love both of them. But for today's comparison, Spider-Man No Way Home versus the Batman, I'm going to have to pick Spider-Man No Way Home as the winner. Both good films, but I think Spider-Man is a great film, so I'm going to pick that as the winner. But I want to hear what your opinion is in the comments down below. Don't just tell me that I'm an idiot. I mean, you can. <laughs> That's fine with me. But also tell me why you think the Batman is better than Spider-Man. I'm always curious to hear your thoughts about why that is. Comment down below. Let me know which movie you think was the better superhero movie. And that is it for today's show. Don't forget new episodes of the Story Geek Show come out every Tuesday and every Thursday. On Thursday, May 5th, Michael Young from Nerd Soul will be joining me to discuss the Moon Knight finale. You know, I didn't like episode five as much as I liked episodes one through four. Four was one of my favorites. I'm really curious how they're going to close it out. Join us on Thursday. You'll hear what we thought of the Moon Knight finale. And before you know it, we will be getting into Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. I'm about to go buy my tickets for that. And we will be getting into Kenobi. So there is some really good stuff on the way. Subscribe to the Story Geek Show on YouTube or on your preferred podcast provider so that you don't miss a single episode. All episodes are published to the podcast feed right after I finish recording them here on YouTube. Leave me a comment and let me know what you think about Spider-Man No Way Home. I'll see you on Thursday.